Inlet. We're going to be steaming for about the next six to seven hours. We're heading offshore to fish for tilefish. Tilefish are a deep water species. They live in 400 to more than 1,000 feet of water. They actually dig burrows called pueblos in clay or mud bottoms. They're really good fighting, they're really good eating, and they are just a lot of fun to catch. We were invited on this trip by my friend Dave Arbeitman. He runs the real seat. Dave is passionate about fishing for tiles. He's one of the pioneers of, of that fishery here in the Northeast. We're gonna catch up with him a little bit later on this trip. He's gonna tell us the ins and outs of fishing for tile fish, the rigs, the bait, and the tackle he likes to use when catching these deep water fish. As the New Jersey coastline faded out of sight, the fishermen aboard the Voyager climbed into their bunks. A square in the tablecloth for a day we didn't talk. Six hours later, we woke to the sound of the Voyager's diesel shutting down as we approached the first drop of the trip. I take in each word of it, reluctantly question. You guys ready? You can start dropping down. After a quick breakfast, fishermen began dropping their baits, and it didn't take long for the fish to start coming over the rail. First drop of the day. Uh, a lot of guys have already hooked up. I just got down there. We're probably in about 600 feet of water. I'd have to ask the captain, but a few fish have been caught already. Some blue line tile fish. I'm uh, sitting here waiting for my first bite. And judging by how everybody else is doing, it shouldn't take too long. I'm getting bit. There we go. Oop. Got two pounds of lead on there that can shake that hook loose, so you just kind of the rod under your shoulder and crank. A little blue line tile fish, my first fish of the day. It came on my first drop. It's a really pretty fish. I mean, you can see it's where they get their name from that little blue line right there. I'm sitting down there with no bait. <laughs> I missed I missed a couple hits. I, I leave the two squid on there. It's pretty likely. It's about right. We all missed a couple bites. Had to. Uh, turns out they stole my bait, which is kind of not what you want to have happen when you're fishing uh, this deep. It takes a long time to reel up to see if you have any bait left. But I'm gonna rebait, drop back to the bottom. The bite's been really good. So. Even though a lot of these high-speed reels have a lot of drag, they don't have a lot of torque. And without a lot of torque, you can't bring a fish up off the bottom. And sometimes you can't even bring your four-pound sinker up off the bottom without a lot of difficulty. And the easiest way to explain it is to compare it to riding a bike, a 10-speed bike, and you come to a hill. And what do you want to do? Do you want to put it in low gear, or do you want to put it in high gear to go up the hill? My two favorite reels for tile fishing is the Maxell Ocean Max 10 which features a 4.5 to 1 gear ratio, and the accurate Extreme Boss 600 Narrow, which features a 4 to 1 gear ratio. The standard tile fish rig consists of one or two circle hooks fished off three-way swivels, weighted to the bottom with two to three pounds of lead. Him. 
strike one. Well, with circle hooks, you really don't have to set. You should really just start cranking, but it doesn't hurt to give it a little bit of a pop this steep. And with the braided line not stretching at all, you really, the, the hooks I'm using are really sharp, so. The captain said we're in about 750 feet of water. Hooked up right away and, well, certainly not getting up to the top right away. have done that, but it's a white hake. Why bring a backup rod, too? Uh. Got a little over-aggressive, swung the, uh, tried to swing the fish and, you know, shortened my rod a little bit, so. But that's, it twice. No, I know. That was, broke it twice there. Do you need another rod? I've got one. Sure? I have a backup. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So you want to make sure you have enough bait on there, but not too much so it's going to spin. It's got 750 feet until it gets to the bottom. If you put too much bait on there, it's going to helicopter and tangle and then just create a whole mess. So a little slim bait like a squid here. A lot of guys use strip baits of either salmon or fluke because the uh, skin from those fish will keep them on the hook a little bit better. So little bait stealers aren't gonna take it off there before you can get a hook into them. Doesn't feel very big, but I'm sure something's on there. Real careful about swinging this one. <laughs> I've got three fish, I've got three different species. I got a blue line tile fish, a white hake, and now added a little rose fish to the cooler. These aren't quite as big, but they're really good eating. You can see they've got those huge eyes so they can see in real deep water. But, uh, so, three fish, three species, it's all part of the uh, all part of the fun of doing the steep drop fishing. You really never know where you're going to reel up next. I've been running boats, uh, fishing boats, since the early 90s. The depth we look for them in can range anywhere from 290 feet to 1,000 feet. Generally, we don't fish much over 1,000 feet unless we're trying to target, you know, we know that there's something there like hake or rosefish. Most of the fishing we do is in, we'll say 350 to 500 feet because it's most amenable to most conditions and to most people. A lot of people don't like to fish in really deep water. And we have areas where we catch smaller fish in 400 feet of water, uh, but there's very little chance for a trophy fish. And then we have you know, deeper spots where there may not be the volume, but there, there is a chance at a you know, 40 or 50 pounder or bigger. So Captain Jeff's bringing us around for another drift. So far, I've got three fish in the box. I have a blue line tile fish, a white hake, and a rose fish, a black belly rose fish. So it really shows you the kind of variety that you get on these deep drop trips. I haven't even caught a golden tile fish, which is the prize of these trips. Golden tiles can get over 50 pounds in weight, and uh, we're fishing some deep water, so we've got a chance to see a real big one. And uh, it sounds like Jeff's slowing down now. We're getting ready to make another drop, and hopefully uh, we'll see some of those big goldens start coming over the rails. Excuse me. Blue's up, bud. At the next spot, we'd found what we were looking for, and golden tilefish started hitting the deck. Golden tile fish seem too beautiful for a fish that lives in virtual darkness. Their scales reflect an array of yellow, teal, purple, and gold. Oh, 
you better have a nice fish on there, Junior. Got a little case of the bends, but uh. Got another double header, nice little tile fish and another rose fish. We uh, certainly are stocking the cooler. We're gonna have a lot of fish to bring home to the office. I'm sure Andy Nebreski is gonna uh, hook them up real nice for us. All right, welcome back, folks. My good friend Jimmy Fee brought me an excellent piece of wreck fish. Uh, today we're gonna be cooking this up. Anytime I get fish that's kind of new to me, I'm not familiar with, I like to cook them fairly simple so I can really enjoy the true nature and flavor of the fish. We're gonna be slow roasting this in the oven with a wine, butter, and saffron sauce. Uh, I'm gonna cook it about 250 for about 45 minutes, real slow. One thing I did notice with these wreck fish fillets is a pretty pronounced uh, set of bones that run along the lateral line. So I just made sure to pull all those out using a small pair of needle nose pliers. Get a nice boneless fillet. This whole thing's ready to go. It's a beautiful looking piece of fish. Just gonna cut off two nice serving size portions. Put just a small amount of olive oil in each one of these. You want to use a ceramic bacon dish for this. Uh, I like the smaller ones as personal individual size servings. You don't want to do this in a metal pan. It'll burn to the pan. Now we're going to give each filet a nice good coating of sea salt. You want to go a little bit heavy on the salt. These are pretty thick filets and it'll get absorbed into the fish as it cooks. All right, next up just a couple of cracks of black pepper. For the wine, we're going to put maybe about two tablespoons of wine in each casserole. You want to use a dry white wine for this, something like a Pinot Grigio is ideal. Also, going to add about a little bit less than a tablespoon of butter to each one of these. Now, for the good stuff, just a little small pinch of saffron. We'll put a little on top of the fish and a little in the juice on the side of the pan. Pretty powerful stuff. You don't need a lot of the saffron in there, but it does add a very nice flavor. Goes very well with fish. And I'm also going to put in a couple of, a few little pieces of thyme. This is fresh thyme. I'm also going to throw just one or two sage leaves in there as well. Put those right in with the broth. And that's about it. We're going to fire these into a preheated 250 degree oven. Uh, we're gonna roast them, probably take about a half an hour. We'll keep an eye on the temperature, internal temperature as they're cooking. They've been in there about 20 minutes. They're about 106, 107. They'll probably need another 10 minutes in the oven. I'm just gonna serve this up with a very simple summer heirloom tomato salad. A little balsamic vinegar, mozzarella cheese, a little olive oil. few slices of a nice sourdough baguette. Just a little sprinkle of fresh minced parsley to make it pretty. So there you have it, very simple dish, slow roasted wreckfish. Uh, we ended up cooking this for about 45 minutes at 250 degrees. Uh, very simple, but we're gonna really be able to taste the true essence of that fish. Nice fresh garden tomato salad, a couple pieces of nice sourdough bread to sop up that wonderful sauce. To cap off the great day of fishing, the anglers on the Voyager retreated to a blazing orange sunset, the likes of which you can only see offshore. As darkness set in, Maria went to work in the galley, preparing steaks and salads for the fishermen who'd worked up an appetite, cranking fish after fish from 800 feet of water.
the sun rising over our second day offshore, we hope to top off our coolers as Captain Jeff positioned the Voyager for our first drift of the morning. So the bait I'm using is squid, which the boat uh, provides. A lot of the guys here have brought their own bait, whether it's uh, strips of fluke or strips of mahi. Some guys have strips of conger eel. And the reason they like those strips of fish is the skin is real durable. See the squid, the fish can tear it off the hook if you miss a fish or miss a couple bites. But uh, strips of fish are going to be a lot more durable, which means you're not going to have to reel up from 400 to 1,000 feet to check your bait. But still, squid works really well. and. Uh, I've been having a lot of luck with it today, so I'm going to stick with it. So just like too much wind and too much drift can be a problem, same goes for when you don't have enough wind and you don't have enough drift. When you're fishing for tilefish, they can be pretty spread out over the bottom, so you need to cover water. So one of the problems we're running into right now is we have a little bit of wind going against a little bit of current. So we're not really covering as much ground as we need to. Captain Jeff is going to reposition the boat right now. So he's going to move us to another spot, hopefully get a little bit better drift and catch some more fish. The real seat started, it was an idea that popped up in 1982. I had worked in another custom rod building shop and one of the customers that was there had approached me about starting his own business. And I thought, well, it sounds like a pretty good idea. We were in our 20s. You can do anything you want when you're in your 20s. With about $6,000 between us, we started a business. This April 1st will be 35 years. The original location was in a shop that was about 350 square feet. This shop is 4,200. I got into tile fishing about 10 years ago, and there wasn't anything I could buy. I mean, even though I was, you know, owned a tackle shop, I couldn't look into a wholesale catalog and find tile fish rigs or any kind of gear, any kind of special rods. It just didn't exist. And so that's really how it started. It started out of necessity. And after one tilefish trip, I realized that this was going to be my passion. We'll be able to get away with two or three pounds of lead here, so. We definitely pulled some weird fish uh, up from the depths. We, we've actually caught a few fish that we don't even know what they are. When we're, a lot of times when we're fishing on the rough bottom, the structure bottom, for the rose fish, we'll see a swallowtail bass. We've caught, uh, we call one Alfonsino, uh, which is a big red fish. But a lot of that stuff, we don't know what it is until we take pictures of it and either send it to some people that we know at the Smithsonian uh, or if we, uh, you know, start looking in books. Yeah, that is, it's a feisty little bugger. I did you got a Oh, no, look at you, man. You were right. I got one. Got one biting. <laughs> Definitely feels different than the rosefish. Feels a little better. Let me know when you see color. It's going to be a little bit. When dropping 700 feet to the bottom, you never know what's going to find your bait next. It could be a small rosefish or something that's going to make you break a sweat as you wrestle it to the surface.
So it's definitely the best fight of the uh, the trip for me. Got a double header of wreck fish. They're, uh, you know, they hang over rougher bottom. They look, I think they're one of the coolest looking fish you see out here. They look just like, like a prehistoric largemouth bass, but like just about everything else are real good eating. But, uh, just, it's just been an awesome trip, and this, is, uh, this has definitely been the highlight for me. So. already working three jobs just to pay for college. So I had no money left to go tile fishing. I think back then it was like, might have been $85. So I never got to do it and always said to myself, I'm gonna do it. And then by the time I got out of college and was making money, the fishery collapsed because of the unregulated long lining. And so I never got to do it. And when, uh, when Jeff started to do it, and was successful, it was like, it just like rekindled that flame. Uh, and after the first trip, the first trip I did, the second tile fish I caught was just about 43 pounds. <laughs> I was like, that's it, I'm hooked on this. And I haven't looked back. <laughs>